to be talking about rabbit vets and fever. We're going to be explaining how our reservoir aren't just cute and cuddly. So for our presentation, we're going to break it down and first talk about the vector, the characteristics and lifestyle, the habits and the geographic range, our reservoir and its characteristics, the disease agent, the disease and the host, susceptibility, symptoms and characteristics of the disease, and lastly, we're going to talk about our disease control plan, how to prevent and treat this disease. So first off, we have the vector. Our group's vector was Aedes vexens, also known as the floodwater mosquito. The order is in Diptera, and the family is in Culicida. And some of the most um, specific characteristics that these mosquitoes have are the presence of the basal bands on their narrow abdomen. They're also in a B-shaped. The mosquito itself is brown in color and has a pointed abdomen. Some of the basal rings are pale, with the ones that are present on the tarsi, and the proboscis is longer than their maxillary palps. They also have three pairs of walking legs and a sputum that has an indefinite pattern of yellow and green markings. In the slide, we're gonna have some pictures of the mosquito where you can see these characteristics, but for now, we're gonna be talking about its life cycle, which could usually take about seven to 10 days, and this is if the temperature and environment is ideal. So first we have the egg stage, which usually hatches between 24 and 48 hours. But for this to happen, the female mosquito must have a blood meal and also requires an aquatic environment for the, late, for the eggs to be laid on. Next, we have the larval or the wiggler stage. This usually is six to eight days and they usually feed by grazing and filtering and usually hatch in between September and October. Then we have the pupil or tumbler stage. And this is about a two to three day process and they turn into adults between the months of early April and late May. After this, their lifespan is about three to six weeks. Now on this slide, we're going to be uh, looking at some pictures. So on this figure one, you have the life cycle of the 80s mosquito. As you can see, it has from the egg to the larval to the pupa and then the adult. And then it's just a cycle over and over again. Then we have some pictures of the mosquito and you can see it's brown color, color um, and then the B-shaped basal bands. You can also see that the abdomen is pointed. And um, over here on figure three, we can see that the proboscis is just longer than the palps, as we mentioned before. And next we're gonna continue and talk about its feeding, mating habits, and the distribution about, uh, around the world. So first we have the females, and the females are the only ones that can feed on blood. The males feed on nectar. And the females are usually active at night in shadier areas, and they primarily feed on larger animals. This includes deers, horses, and cows. But they're also known to be opportunistic feeders. And these, this usually means that they feed on mammals that are most available, which is why sometimes uh, humans can be bitten in the process. So their breeding grounds usually is near water, and during this process, uh, females fly into swarms of males so that the males can grasp her and produce, and they produce about 100 eggs after a blood meal. As you can see, the map here on the bottom right, um, they're usually found all around North America, which is why they're known as the dominant mosquito for mo most parts of the continent. But they tend to decrease in higher elevations. So then uh, the nuisance begins in the peak of June, but usually starts in the beginning of May and ends in the season of October. And they're usually at a peak in rainier seasons at night or in shadier areas. Next, we have our reservoir. So for our reservoir, we had jackrabbits and rabbits. We got this information based on ProMed mail notification that we got and through the test results of the ELS ELISA. These are some pictures of our reservoirs and we're gonna be talking a little bit about each of them in the next three slides. So the first, for the first one, we have Lupus californicus and some of the main characteristics for this rabbit has uh, the long ears with the black colored tip, and you can see this in the picture here on the left. 
They also have a dark fur with a creamy white color under the belly and the legs, a black stripe on the ventral surface of the tail, and females are usually larger than the males. They are larger and leaner than rabbits, and they're actually hares, not rabbits. For our next reservoir, we have this Silivicus polytris. This is how we're going to say it today. And this is a medium sized rabbit. It's short, has rounded ears, and the underside of the cotton tail is not white. This is what distinguishes them from the other white cotton tail here on the right. They have longer toenails on their front hind feet, and their fur ranges from a dark to reddish brown. For our next rabbit, we have the Lupus Townsendi. They are large, have great ears with black tips. The fur usually changes from the winter and the brown from uh, in the winter and brown in the summer, and they have hard, large hind legs. This is usually distinguishes them from the other jackrabbits. Um, the fact that they can change their coats in different seasons, and now we have the last uh, reservoir. So we have Silivicus bachni. This is how we're going to say that one today. They also have a white cotton tail, and unlike the other rabbit, they have a white underside. They are evenly dark in their fur and usually range from orange, gray, and black. They have small ears, and the females are usually larger than the males. So uh, for the first reservoir, they are usually found in West Central Canada and the U.S. They are native to areas such as British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, and etc. They live in open glass, grasslands, pastures, fields, and can also be found in forested areas. The breeding season of the white-tailed jackrabbit lasts from February to July, with a peak from March to June. The white-tailed jackrabbits are herbivores, and that they usually feed on grasses and shrubs. They are known to feed extensively on hay found inside of barns, so that's how they usually come in contact with people. Uh, but other than that, there is no such, um, there's no important medical importance to them. Um, and for the next reservoir, we're going to be talking about Lupus californicus. They are the black-tailed jackrabbit. They are found throughout the southwestern United States and Mexico. And this usually extends east to Missouri, north into Washington, Idaho, Colorado, and Nebraska. They prefer the desert, scrubland, prairies, farmlands, and dunes, so the complete opposite of the other lupus jackrabbit. Uh, they favor regions and areas of short grass. Their breeding ranges are from February to May. And this is for the, the jackrabbits that are found in the northern parts. And usually it extends from December to September. And this is for the jackrabbits found in the southern parts. Um, in warm areas, they, the breeding usually lasts all year round, and they can feed on shrubs, small trees, grasses, and forbs. These jackrabbits are known to do considerable damage to farms, forest plantations, and young trees. And now for the rabbits, we have uh, our first reservoir. They are known as the marsh, marsh rabbit. They are found in the southeast parts of the U.S., and the range is limited to the lower Florida Keys due to endangerment. Their main source of habit, habitats are found near freshwater marshes and require vegetation near a permanent source of water. And this uh, should not exceed about 152 meters in elevation. Their breeding season is from February to September and can typically have about two to five offspring in their gest gestation period, uh, which lasts about 28 to 37 days. Some common parasitic, uh, parasitic species that can be found in the marsh rabbits include ticks, fleas, rabbit fleas, and warble fleas. Um, and in some cases, these rabbits can host ticks that carry Rocky Mountain fever. So unlike the other two jackrabbits, this does have a negative importance. So um, most of their human contact can't, is not as harmful, but when it does, it can cause disease. Um, which brings us to our last reservoir, and this is the other rabbit known as the brush rabbit. We have the Western brush rabbit, and they can usually range from Columbia River in Oregon, southward to the tip of Baja, Mexico, and from the east um, of the Cascade, so, uh, Sahara, Nevada ranges, and desert areas that are west throughout most of California. They are primarily found in areas that are dense with bushy covers, and their breeding season be begins in December and lasts until May or June. For the rabbits that are found in Oregon, 
Their breeding season is from April to August, and they are usually hunted for sport and food by humans. They are also captured and raised as pets, but are considered a pest since they are known to cause damage to crops and vegetation on farms. And that brings us to an end of our reservoirs. Disease agent, Bacterium salmonella brundage. This is our scientific name, it comes from the family Enterobacteriaceae. Its genome size is around 173.32 MB. It's a gram-negative bacteria with the bacillus rod shape. We performed the following tests to determine that we had, in fact, had salmonella as our bacteria. Our oxidase test came back negative, indicating it was not aerobic. Our Bogues per skewer test came back negative, indicating the bacterium does not produce acetylmethylcarbonyl during glucose metabolism. However, our Simon citric agar test came back positive, which indicates that the bacterium uses citrate as its sole source of carbon. We also used the KCN test, which came back negative, indicating the bacterium does not utilize potassium cyanide as carbon and nitrogen source. Our Jordan tartar agar test came back positive, indicating the bacterium fermented sodium tartate. Our carbohydrate fermentation test for sucrose came back negative, indicating that the bacterium did not ferment sucrose. Lastly, we did a carbohydrate fermentation test with xylose. This came back negative, indicating that the bacterium is in fact an unknown salmonella species. Considering that the species was unknown, we concluded we had a new species, which we decided to name Salmonella Brundage. Disease. The disease was a rabbit vexin fever, which was named after its reservoir and vector. It is related to acute bronchitis and targets the respiratory tract and can lead to death without proper treatment. The symptoms are cough, tracheal burning, sore throat, apnea, lack of appetite, deep cyanosis, headache, fever, and chest pain signs suggesting consolidation. Supportive treatment, IV antivirals and IV antibacterials were all ineffective in treating this disease, and individuals who traveled or spent time outdoors were more, more prone to the disease. Now, next is host and patient information. The patients experienced uh, tracheal burning, productive cough, deep cyanosis, apnea, fever, and rash. Patient zero was thought to be Grace Clements because she was the one who traveled the most around the country, giving her a better chance to spread the disease. And her trips to Los Angeles, California, San Francisco, California, and Tampa, Florida stood out because Abby Clark, Doug Naylor, and Martin Rush were also traveled or lived in those areas. These opened up the possibility of transmission, and therefore the spread was more effective. No one traveled outside of North America, though. Host and patient information. All of the patients and hosts had some type of contact with mosquitoes, whether it was at home or on their travel, supporting our initial theory of having a mosquito as our vector. All of the patients did not respond to anti bacterial and antiviral medications provided by the hospital. The patients were Cheryl Green, lives in Clininda, Iowa. The site of infection was Clarinda, Iowa. Crystal Emerson lives in Camden, Arkansas. Site of infection, Camden, Arkansas. Diane Cole, she lived in Portland, Oregon, and site of infection was Portland, Oregon. Doug Naylor, who lived in Brynard, Montana, and also got infected in Los Angeles. Landon Shaw lived in Canada and was infected in Canada. Frank Hollister lived in Chaffee County, Colorado, and was infected in the same place. Grace Clements, who is patient zero, lived in Midland, Texas, and site of infection was Seattle, Washington. Martin Ruth lived in Tallahassee, Florida, and his site of infection was Tampa, Florida. Hope Graham lived in Sproul State Forest, Reno, uh, Pennsylvania, and was infected in the same place. And Abby Clark lived in Fremont County, Wyoming, and site of infection was Reddings, California. Next, we'll talk about control plan. Control plan. As a group, we decided to break the link between the host and pathogen via vaccine. Destroying an entire mosquito species or habitat are very large-scale attacks that create a lot of environmental and ecosystem damage, 
which would in turn create a lot of public backlash. Our initial patients were treated with antibiotics. However, those all proved to be ineffective, pushing us towards a vaccine. We chose to use a subunit vaccine because it is effective on a wide range of patients. Those with a healthy immune system and a weakened immune system are both able to use it. A subunit vaccine works by exposing the body to a specific part of the disease germ, such as its protein, so that when the body encounters it later on, it is already familiar with it and has the antibody to fight it. The only drawback encountered with the subunit vaccine is that patients will need booster shots after initial vaccination. Step 1. Research the disease, collect data on production costs and supply, find evidence that the, the disease is a burden to the general public, and evidence that other methods of treatment were ineffective. Since our disease was found in the United States, vaccination will be mandatory for all citizens, all people residing in the United States with a green card or visa, and those traveling before re-entering the country. Based off of these numbers, we will need about 345 million units of the vaccine. They will first be distributed to areas of high risk, such as Iowa, Wyoming, Arkansas, Colorado, Texas, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Texas will be closely monitored because this is where we found our patient zero. Step two, implement vaccine into clinical trials and monitor the data and progress through the five developmental phases, research, discovery, preclinical testing, clinical testing, and regulatory approval. The vaccine will be tested in controlled clinical settings where we will use adult subjects with a healthy immune system to ensure that we are getting a proper immune response. We will not be placing any strict deadlines on the production of this vaccine because we want to ensure that we are going to have an effective and safe vaccine that will not create any short or long-term harm for our patients. We will be using groups of 200 adults per trial and repeat the trials as needed. Step 3. Formulating and developing a 3-5 to five year comprehensive multi-year plan that focuses on how to prepare, implement, monitor, and evaluate the introduction of the vaccine to the public. We will be using school-based vaccination, special campaigns, and the addition of the vaccine into the infant immunization schedule to help promote awareness for our vaccine. Campaigns will be targeted, especially around the 80s vaccines season, which is from May to October. Our team will make sure that healthcare professionals responsible for administering the vaccine are adequately trained in the storage, disposal, use, and record keeping of vaccination. Along with this, we will make sure that they are well aware of the early warning signs of our disease. In order to help fund and advocate for our vaccine, we will look for donors from pharmaceutical companies, political organizations, and other groups such as the World Health Organization. Step 4. Implementing our plan and monitoring its success. Healthcare facilities that carry the vaccine will be required to report the number of vaccines given, cases diagnosed, as well as deaths to the government. We estimate that from testing to 100% vaccination, it will take about 10 to 15 years and cost roughly 200 to 500 million dollars. During this process, we'll be partaking in other measures to help limit the spread of the disease by using campaigns that will help raise public awareness. We also plan on implementing jackrabbit population control due to the fact that they are a main reservoir of the disease. Finally, we will reach out to the CDC and other hospitals and organizations early on to help us spread awareness and monitor the number of cases of our disease. So in conclusion, the expected outcome is that the vaccine will help reduce infection and death rates. However, we do not predict 100% vaccination of the entire population due to the anti-vaccine community and those who are immunocompromised. Despite these individuals, we still expect our plan to be successful due to the majority of the population complying with the process. The number of individuals who do receive the vaccination will limit the spread of the disease and the others due to the principle of herd immunity, putting into consideration the possible protests of the vaccine and the risks for at-risk groups such as the elderly and infants. It is safe to say that the reduction of the disease is inevitable with the proper vaccination campaigns and public education of the process.